Welcome to part three of today's lecture. So in the last part, I gave you a bunch of examples of vector spaces. And I wanted to start off this part with another example of a vector space that will be used a number of times. So here is my notation for the set that I want to look at. So P sub n. And what I have in P sub n are all the polynomials of degree less than or equal to n where the coefficients are coming from the real numbers. So as a specific example, P2 contains all the polynomials of degree two or less where the coefficients belong to the real numbers. Now you're used to thinking about polynomials in calculus and you're looking evaluating the functions uh, at particular points or graphing them. This is a slightly different perspective. You just want to think of the collection of all polynomials. And what we're gonna do is point out is that set of all polynomials is actually a vector space. And I'll explain right now about how we can make the set of polynomials a vector space, right? So first of all, you have to understand what are the vectors, right? Well, what are the vectors in this case? The vectors are polynomials. So that's what our objects are, okay? So now you know what our elements are. Now you have to be able to add them and do your scalar multiplication. So how should addition work? Well, addition works as follows. It's basically the it, polynomial addition that you're used to from calculus. So let's say you have one polynomial and you have a second polynomial, both of degree n or less. Then the sum of these two polynomials is simply the sum of the two polynomials. So you, you add them the way that you would do in calculus and you group uh, terms by which power of t group the coefficients by their powers, and that would be the sum of two polynomials. Okay. What about scalar multiplication of my vectors? Well, it will just be regular scalar multiplication of uh, polynomials. Okay, so scalar multiplication. We would say that a constant times my polynomial pt would just be the polynomial that you get by multiplying each of the coefficients by the constant c. And I'll do an example in a second. Now, you should also, we won't do it right here, but of course you really need to check to, that this is a vector space by checking all the 10 axioms. So you need to check the 10 axioms really to verify that this is a vector space. Luckily the textbooks does this uh, so I'll just defer to their textbook. But the important thing here to notice is the zero polynomial in this set, uh, the zero vector in this set is the zero polynomial. So that's kind of a handy thing to know. So it's the polynomial where you have all zero coefficients. So this is the zero polynomial. And as promised, I will give you an example of what I mean by these uh, by these operations in a second. But the point is here is that Pn, a collection of polynomials of degree n, gives you a vector space, a less than or equal to n. And so for each n, we're getting a different vector space. So we're getting an infinite number of new examples of vector spaces that look quite different than what we're used to seeing. So as promised, let me just give you kind of some examples of this. I could take pt to be the polynomial one plus two t squared, and qt could be negative one plus two t plus three t squared. And both of these guys live in p2 because they're polynomials degree two or less. And the sum of these guys is simply zero well, I guess here I'll write out all the details for you. So one plus minus one plus zero plus two t plus, and because this guy term has no has uh, no term involving t, and this term over here is two plus three t squared, and let's just clean it up. We end up with two t plus 
5t squared. Uh, and so that gives you an example of the polynomial addition. Okay, so that gives you a different vector space. Okay, so at this point, we define what a vector space is and we have a bunch of examples of vector spaces. But the other thing that we might wanna do is look at inside of our vector space and look for things that also behave like a vector space. And so that's what a, a subspace is. So a subspace of a vector space, or let me underline it in red here because it's kind of important. A subspace of, oh, and I forgot a word here, of a vector space V is a subset of your space such that H also has the property of being a vector space. Okay. Now, it looks like if I were to ask you to check whether something is a vector space, you would have to go back to that long list of axioms and check that H satisfies all those properties. But it's actually not the case. What happens is there's a nice useful fact that allows you to quickly check whether a set is a subset is a subspace. So let's say you have a vector space. Somebody hands you some something sitting inside of V and asks, is it, is it of a subspace? And how can you check? Well, you can check by just checking three things. First of all, you can check that zero belongs to H. Right? So the zero vector of V also belongs to H. So if H doesn't have the zero vector, it can't be a vector space. Secondly, is that it's closed under the operation. So if U and V are in H, then the sum of the two things are still in H. And similarly, if U is in H and C is in R, then it's closed under the scalar, multi uh, scalar multiplication. So you don't have to check all 10 axioms. You're basically checking the axiom uh, whether zero, you're checking to see if zero belongs to H and then you're checking the axioms one and six. And you can look in the textbook to see why this is enough to check whether a subset is also a subspace. So I have an example here uh, to show you to show you, and I'm gonna leave you to think a little bit about it before I come back to this in the next part. So let's say you take H containing to be the zero vector. And you wanna show that this is a subspace of V, okay? So any vector space here will contain a zero vector. Take H to be that zero vector. This is a subset of V. And the claim is that this actually forms a subspace. So I'm gonna let you think about this and we'll check the details after the break.